All right, guys, welcome. It's Cap with Lantern Light Capital. Good to have you. We're on Chapter 5. This is where it starts to get interesting. Baby, what do you think about raising some equity? Good? Who do you got with you? Gary Ramerson, and he's blind, and his arm's super long, and he's so slow. Oh, my gosh. All right, let me do Chapter 5. Baby just loves getting in on these. All right, Chapter 5. A lot to go over here, but this is this is where we're getting into the meat. I know that those bank loan sections were tough, and we're transitioning from, again, what was the mantra with bank loans? Negotiate. And what was the mantra with investors? Do what's right and know your customer, which is your investor. So types of equity are very important here. Common equity, pref equity, so one common equity, two pref equity, 2.5 is going to be participating, 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 pref equity, and then finally, mezzanine. Talk about mezzanine debt. All right. Now, these are very important because you're going to be telling your investors about the stack. Remember, the stack, we talked about the stack before. Who gets paid first? The bank. Who gets paid last? You, GPs, okay? Who gets paid second to last but has the biggest upside? Common equity, aka the LPs, aka the capital partners, toll partners, okay? So the stack, one, five, four. And then who gets paid here to pref equity, why do I keep, who do I keep having to have as three? The mezzanine can go in any, <clears throat> uh, kind of anywhere within this stack. I guess that's the only part of the stack. Why am I, why do I keep doing one through five? Anyways, um, this is the stack. It's very important to know who gets paid first. So the, the folks within common equity, the people that get paid last are you, the GP, well, me, the GP, and if you're an investor, you, the limited partner, aka the guy that I come to and I say, hey, we got an awesome self-storage deal. Would you like to participate? So a couple things about being an LP. The LP has... No risk other than their capital, their original capital, right? I might have to put, uh, I might have a loan uh, where I have to actually put some of my assets on the line, right? It could be a recourse loan. And as a GP or the person that uh, signs on that recourse loan, I might ha actually put my real money on the line. As an LP, your only risk is your initial capital. So you put $100,000 into the deal, yeah, it might go to 90000 might go to whatever, Um Alternatively, you have a very high upside as well because the way the GPs work is that they are getting one that will typically, we'll go to the GP here, they're typically going to get uh, a preferred return, and that's different from pref equity. <laughs> so 8%, right? <clears throat> so they get 8% before, oh, the GP, sorry, that was supposed to be, can I do that? I'll delete it. The LP gets a preferred return of 8%. Okay. That means before I get paid as a GP, you're going to get your 8%. So again, Lantern Light Capital doesn't make money until you make money. There's no way out of that except for uh, except for our fees, right? And again, those fees are part of what makes us do what we do. We need a good team to underwrite these deals. Uh, and that's why we're very transparent with the fees as well. So bank gets paid first, then preferred equity. You kind of get what the LP does, right? That's the investor, aka the capital partner. Um, no risk other than their kind of initial capital. What is their job? They got to vet deals, right? Give feedback, feedback. They should be paying attention to their distributions, distributions. They should kind of be paying attention to what's going on with the deal. What's the role of the GP, aka the sponsor, aka Lantern Light Capital? Although we've been LPs in deals before. Um, they got to find the deal, find it, structure it, structure, underwrite the deal, underwrite. Um, we do get the fees, 
right? We get some fees and then we also get profit. So who are the two folks that profit the most on the deal? That's the folks that make up the common equity. And technically four and five could kind of be combined, right? Because the common equity is made up of the LPs, aka the guys that mostly fund the deal, the um, capital partners and the GPs, the managing partners. And typically, we mentioned this before, the GPs, aka Lantern Light Capital, uh, will contribute some degree of their own money, their own skin in the game. And this is a red flag too, right? You're dealing with a Rob mentions this in the book, and again, we're reviewing this book, Structuring and Raising Debt and Equity for Real Estate. If a GP wants to get in on a deal and they're not willing to put some of their money into that, basically that LP pool, that equity pool, that's a little bit of a red flag, right? Because they're getting fees, they're getting all the upside, but they're not putting any skin in the game. So every deal that we participate in at Lantern Light Capital, we're putting our own skin in the game, it just is what it is. And some banks require that. So that's the GPs and the LPs here. Now, let's go down to PREF equity. Again, bank, PREF, common, GP. So the PREF equity. PREF equity. How does this work? Well, preferred equity, we talked about this before, aka dual tranche. And, you know, if you want to sound cool, is there an N there? Oh my god, tranche. Oui, monsieur, dual tranche. A dual tranche structure. Th this equity still sits below the senior loan. Remember, bank is one, pref is two. And mind you, pref equity, different from preferred return. The preferred return is that 8% that the LPs get before me as a GP, before I get any money. That's your preferred return. Pref equity is that equity where instead of a GP, or sorry, instead of an LP, where you get um, you know all these returns. If you're a self storage facility, you thought it would make ten percent. Oh, Jesus, you thought it would make ten percent by year five, ten percent year year on year by year uh, by year five, and it really makes thirty percent. The thing just shoots through the roof. Um, those LPs and me as a GP are going to make that extra 20% there. Woo -wee, we're happy. Pref equity is not like that. They have a fixed rate. So say you set them at 8%. Those, that pref equity doesn't get any thing above 8%, but they get paid first before the LPs, before the GPs. And some uh, limited partners, some LPs, investors that are getting common equity, uh, they might not like that. They might not like that somebody's getting 8% before they are. But it might be what need to be done to have the, the, the deal go through, and it might be a really good deal. And so this gets into what is the mantra for banks? Negotiate and understand. What is the mantra for investors? Do what's right and know your customer. And so you might actually have a scenario, not you might, but it's very common. Everybody has different things they want out of a deal. And this gets into how to communicate with investors, how to understand what investors want. Some investors don't necessarily know all, all the things that they want. If they're incredibly sophisticated, a big family office, something like that, yes. They're going to have very specific criteria. And they that might, it's not like some emotional thing. It's like, no, this is just our protocol and some other big family office or whatever might have another one. It just is what it is. And so know your investors and know what they want. That's the preferred equity, pref equity or the dual tranche structure. They get a fixed rate, but none of that extra upside above that fixed rate. Now, there's also something we talked about common, common, pref, and now participating pref equity. That was two, right? Two, and then participating, 2.5. Mix of Roman numeral and standard. Oof, yikes, that shouldn't be allowed. Preferred, sorry, participating, participating, pref equity. What is that? Well, that's basically a structure where, remember this pref equity gets that 8%, 
only. They don't have any upside beyond that 8%. Well, you can set up a structure participating preferred equity where they hit a certain equity kicker. So this makes the the stack, the waterfall, even more complex because it would, in this case, it goes bank, preferred equity, um, which <laughs> they're together, participating pref, those two are together, um, and then your common, which is subdivided into your LPs and your GPs. And then finally, um, once these LPs get paid, but before the GPs get paid, and you could change this if you want, the participating pref, remember this was at 8% and uh, preferred return, and let's set the uh, LPs at 8% too, and you make, uh, say, 30%, right? So you're making 30%, the LPs get their 8% plus that extra 22, right? That extra above and that 22 is split. The GPs finally start to get a little bit. And then actually a little bit of that goes back to the, whoops, back to here, the participating preferred. So they get their eight plus say another three or something like that. They get a small amount of additional upside, but not as much as if they were complete regular old LPs with that common equity. Again, common equity can make the most out of the deal. Absolutely. If a deal goes well, you definitely want to be common equity. Uh, and then mezzanine debt, finally. Do, do, do. That was Roman numeral trace. Mix of Roman, Spanish, and everything. All right. That's mezzanine debt. Mezzanine debt. This is a type of debt where think of it kind of similar to PREF. Remember, what's PREF again? They have a guaranteed return of 8%. Well, not guaranteed. Nothing's guaranteed in the deal, right? If it goes bad, nobody gets anything. But they get paid first, after the bank, obviously. They're the first investor that gets paid their 8%. Um, mezzanine debt, very similar. They get their 8%. But um, if something... They technically don't own the equity. They own a pledge for the equity. Holy crap. So what's the relevance of that? Well, one of the main relevances is that they don't actually own the equity. And because of that, they don't get the tax benefits of owning the equity. Um, they just own a pledge for the equity. So a little bit complex there. Um you know, whether you would decide to do that, whether mezzanine debt is getting involved, you're getting very, very advanced on how you're structuring uh, these deals. Basically, they hold uh, a pledge for the equity unless until things go wrong, and then they get that, you know, they get that portion of the equity. Um, all right, crew, hopefully we're doing well. What chapter was this? Chapter five, intro to equity. Stick with me. We're getting there. Hopefully you're learning a lot. What was the mantra again? One, banks negotiate. Two, with investors, do what's right and know your customer. And that's the whole reason I want you to understand. And as a as a as um, an LP, if you're looking to invest in syndications, this is important to know. And I remember like, we, we didn't even get into class A and B. We'll get into that, which within the common section, that's why, ugh. I remember now why I had it broken down, one, two, three, four, five. Within common equity, you can have class A, class B. That's actually just a, it sounds kind of good, but it's basically just a way of saying, hey, um, I'm trying to raise a million bucks. You know, the minimum investment is 50K. I'm trying to raise 1 million. Okay. Minimum investment is 50K. And for 50K, you get, you know, a preferred return of, uh, 7%. And for that 50K, you know, you get um, you know, 2% equity or something like that, uh, which is what each percent is 25,000 per percent. Screw it, make it 1%. Sorry, I'm trying to make this easy for you guys. There we go. You get 1%. So for your 50K, you get 1% of equity and you get a 7% preferred rate of return, PREF, okay? But if you give me, if you give me over, I need to raise a million, right? If you wanna be a big dog and come in here and big dog it, and you give me 
500K, so minimum's 50, but if you give me 500K or more, I'll actually give you, instead of uh, 1%, what, what percent would this guy, this guy should get 10%, right? Because every 50K was 1%. I'll actually give him, instead of that 10, which would be the same as the uh, um, class, technically you, you normally call this, class A is that little guy, class B is uh, is the big dog. I think that's I think that's a PR. I don't know the story behind that. I always thought it was like a PR maneuver to make the little guys feel good. <laughs> I don't know. We uh, maybe we'll make up our own name. I don't know if it's a legal thing. We'll call it class uh, class baby class <laughs> baby class stock big dog stock. Uh, you know it, the point is the name of the class doesn't matter. But if you are a class B stock where you have, uh, you're given this 500K, instead of getting the 10% that you're deserved under what it would have been before, we'll actually give you uh, 11%. So you get extra, right? And instead of your 7% pref, we'll give you 8%. Now remember, this, this uh, under common stock, your preferred rate of return, your guaranteed return, which again, it's not guaranteed, it just gets paid before the GPs get paid. It doesn't matter unless the deal goes a little bit sour and you don't hit that number. But once you hit that number, then you start dividing stuff up. Um, so anyways, yeah, that is the whole class structure. And that's still under this concept of common, um, of common equity. All right. Solid work. <laughs> Stick with me, crew. Wishing you all the best.